Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2015-2016 GeoPRISM's Distinguished Lectureship Program. In academia, we have a tendency to artificially compartmentalize information into specific disciplines. Although this distinguished lecture is being funded by a National Geosciences grant and hosted by the Department of Geosciences, the scope of this topic reaches far beyond geosciences. This topic also addresses anthropology, biology, and history, um, to name the most obvious connections. And we're very grateful to have the support of the EKU Libraries, EKU Anthropology Program, Noel Studio for Academic Creativity, EKU Honors Program, and the College of Arts and Sciences. No matter what your background or interest, there is something valuable that you can take away from this lecture presented tonight by the GeoPRISM's distinguished lecturer, Dr. Andrew Nyblade. Dr. Nyblade was born and raised in Tanzania, Africa, which gives him a unique perspective on this area of research. In addition to being an academic, having earned his bachelor's degrees from Wittenberg University, his master's degree from the University of Wyoming, and his PhD from the University of Michigan, he also has non-academic work experience with Exxon and put his earth science education degree to good use teaching high school math and physics in Tanzania. He is highly engaged in his profession with membership in four major geoscience professional societies and is an award-winning geophysicist. Tonight, Dr. Nyblade will explore the link between tectonic activity and human origins. If this topic interests you, he will also be presenting a technical talk tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. in ROARC 203, where he will discuss in more depth the unique structural and tectonic environment of East Africa. Some background in geosciences would be helpful for tomorrow's talk, but is not necessary. So welcome, Dr. Nedley. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me here to give this give this talk. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fun talk. I want to start with, uh, with a caveat, though. I'm not a paleontologist. Uh, my background is in uh, earthquake seismology and, and, and deep earth structure, so this is a bit of a stretch for me, but it's a fun topic, so uh, I, hope, I hope I can uh, share some of my interest in this topic with you today. Um, Thanks to all of the units here that are supporting uh, me to come here, and also thanks to the GeoPRISMS program. GeoPRISMS program is a program at, at the National Science Foundation that funds research, geodynamic research on working and subduction zone margin processes. Uh, they also have an outreach office, and, the, and part of the outreach office supports uh, people like myself who are doing research in these areas to go around and, and, and give uh, talks on, on uh, on relevant research. Uh, so that's a little bit about why, what GeoPRISMS is and, and, and why I'm here giving this talk. So this is a picture from northern Tanzania, if any of you have been there. This is a, a, one of the rift scarps, big rift fault in northern Tanzania. There's another one in the background here. Uh, this is the Lake Natron Basin. So Lake Natron is just off the, off the map here to, to, to the north, if any of you have been in, in this part of the country, in, in East Africa. So what I want to talk about is the formation of the Rift Valley in East Africa. So structures such as these, these this valley here, and the, the, the Rift Valley faults, and uh, address the question of whether there's a connection with, with human origins. As you'll see in the first part of the talk, there has been a substantial literature over the last few decades trying to make a connection between human uh, evolution in this part of Africa and the, the tectonic formation of, of the Rift system. Uh, so I'll present that in the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I'll tell you what I think is going on. Okay, so uh, for starters, uh, there's, I just want to get everyone oriented uh, geographically. Uh, this is a digital elevation map of Africa. All the areas in orange and red here are over a kilometer in elevation. And the rift system, the East African rift system, starts up here in the Afar Depression in northern Ethiopia, and it runs through Ethiopia uh, into East Africa proper here. Uh, and then all the way down through this area into, into central Mozambique down here. Now this is a very large area, Africa is a big place, and so to help you understand how big Africa is and how extensive this area is right through here, the area that we'll be talking about, uh, you can look at this map here and compare, and it's, it's roughly the size of the lower 48, this, this entire area. So, it, so it, it's a, a very substantial area geographically. 
Now, also in this talk, I'll be uh, mentioning some, some critical times in, in the geologic past. Uh, so here's the geologic time scale, and I just want to make sure everyone is, is uh, uh, understanding of, of these different time periods. We'll be talking mainly about the Miocene period going forward, the late Miocene in particular. Uh, yeah, but I'll also be mentioning uh, an area in, in Tanzania where there are rocks that are Archean in age. Uh, Archean is 2.5 billion to 3.8 billion. So these are some of the oldest rocks on the planet. Uh, it's a critical area in East Africa that plays a part of the a role and part of the story I, I want to tell you. So we're going to talk about Archean a little bit later on, and then most of the most of what the action that we'll, we'll be looking at is, is taking place in the Miocene epoch and then going forward. Uh, so the East African Rift System proper again runs from the Afar Depression here in, in northern Ethiopia. It splits the Ethiopian Plateau, this area that's up through here. So this is the main Ethiopian Rift running through here. It extends down through this area, low-lying area between Ethiopia and Kenya, uh, and then continues through the western part of Kenya, right through here, and into northern Tanzania. The area from the main Ethiopian rift all the way through Kenya and into northern Tanzania is, is often referred to as the eastern branch of the rift system. And there is a western branch that has, has developed over here on the other side, the western side of the East African Plateau. So here's the plateau. And this is the western branch going from northern Uganda uh, along the borders between Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, down, down through here, southern Tanzania, and into Malawi. And it also, the, the rift system extends down here into Mozambique. So here, geographically, are, are the countries I just mentioned. Uh, so Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, and then Malawi is here, and then all the way down in, in, into, into Mozambique. So it's a long, long rift system. It's about 4,000 kilometers uh, north to south. You go all the way from down here in Mozambique uh, and upwards to, to the Far Depression. Uh, so the area, part of the rift system is covered with Cenozoic volcanics. Uh, so these are all volcanics. Most of them are maybe 20, 25 million years or younger. Some of them are, are 30 million years old. The area that is covered in, in volcanics is shown on this map here. So the yellow area here through Ethiopia and into Kenya and into Tanzania along the eastern branch right here. So it's coming down this area through Ethiopia and into Kenya and into northern Tanzania here. So that area, everywhere there's yellow, it's covered with Cenozoic uh, volcanics. So the eastern branch of the rift system, there's been a lot of volcanism along this branch. There's been, uh, by comparison, very little volcanism in the western branch. So the western branch is over here, and the, this area through here. And there's a few isolated volcanic fields up here, in this area, and then there's one right here in southern Tanzania, the Rumba Volcanic Province right there, which we will come back to. It's important later, later in, the, in the talk. Now, sitting in the middle of the East African Plateau, uh, right here, is this peanut-shaped feature. This is the Archean Tanzania Craton, so this is the area where the crust is, is, is Archean in age. And beneath this area, because the crust is so old, we think that the plate, or the lithosphere, is very thick, on the order of probably 150 to 200 kilometers thick, whereas the, the plate is much thinner around it, say on the order of 100 kilometers or so. So I'll come back to that later in the talk, too. So keep in mind this area with, with uh, old crust with very thick, a very thick plate. So the time period of interest in terms of uh, hominid evolution really takes off about eight million years ago. And that's when we have the main divergence between the hominids and the other great apes. Uh, so again, it's the late, the late Miocene here, this time period around eight, eight million years. So this is a critical juncture. If we want to look at what's happening with the rift development, in, in Eastern Africa, and we want to try to couple that and see what's going on with respect to, to hominid evolution. This eight million year time frame is, is, the, is the most critical period, and then moving forward from that. So, as I mentioned, to start with, over the last several decades, there's been many papers trying to make a connection between uh, human evolution and the origin of the Rift system, and if you want to think Geologically about this, you might even uh, be so bold as to say it, there might be a tectonic forcing of human evolution. Uh, and this is just one of the papers uh, that is of, of, of importance by Pickford. This was published in 1990. And the title is here, an uplift of the roof of Africa and its bearing on human, uh, the evolution of mankind. Uh, and in this paper and, and several others that have been published, there's really two important suggestions that try to make this connection between human evolution and, and tectonics in, in East Africa. And the first one is that the plateau uplift, primarily the East African plateau, 
uh, influenced hominid evolution through climate. So the plateau came up, that changed the climate, and we'll talk a little bit about how that, that, they, that, they may, that may have happened. But it's mainly a regional climate story uh, by, the, by the plateau rising. And the second one is more localized, and it has to do with the development of the Rift Valleys proper uh, and the topography along the edges of the, of the Rift Valleys uh, creating uh, local climate regimes that may have been favorable for hominid evolution, and also physical environments that may have also promoted hominid evolution. So let's look at these two in a little bit more detail. The first one is this idea of regional climate. Uh, so with the regional story making this connection between tectonics forcing climate and climate changing the, the environment, uh, the environment being then more favorable for hominid evolution, uh, the suggestion here is that on a regional scale, we have uplift associated with the plateau. This uplift changed the atmospheric uh, wind patterns, uh, which were more zonal prior to the uplift. Uh, so they were bringing in moisture from the, the ocean, from the Indian Ocean, and, and the, the area was much more uh, substantially vegetated uh, with, with, with denser forests. Uh, so the plateau comes up, and that changes the vegetation. Uh, with the local climate story, we're looking at the roof flank uplifts. We'll talk about and show some pictures of the flanks of the roofs uplifting. And that creates uh, uh, weather patterns locally, so microclimates that affect uh, rainfall patterns on a more localized scale. So one of the major papers that uh, argued that the uplift of the plateau in East Africa, which changed the vegetation, uh, was this paper here, published in 2006. And in this paper, uh, it was mainly a paleoclimate study, make, running paleoclimate models to show what would happen to atmospheric circulation and then precipitation and, and influence of vegetation across eastern Africa. And they argued that the plateau came up at, at this critical time 8 million years ago. And because of that, it, it created a, to, a topographic barrier prior to 8 million years. There was this zonal circulation and with lots of moisture transport and strong precipitation across eastern Africa. And so with the uplift of the plateau, wind patterns changed, precipitation changed, and the area, the area became much more arid, and the savanna grasslands developed, which really helped to promote bipedalism in, in, in particular. Uh, now, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't run a global circulation models and so forth, so it's hard for me to address you know, how good these climate models are but I do know quite a bit about the, the tectonic history of, of Eastern Africa. So the question I asked was, is the timing right? Did the East African Plateau actually form at, at around this, this critical time period of, of 8 million years? Is there, can we demonstrate that there's a connection actually between the uplift of that plateau at the right time when we see the, uh, the divergence and the evolution of the hominids? Uh, so here graphically showing the the area that's uplifted. So this is the key area here across the East African Plateau. We know that the Ethiopian Plateau formed about 30 million years ago, well before uh, that 8 million, critical 8 million time period. We think the Southern African Plateau, all this area has been, been there for a long, long time, probably going all the way back at 80 million years or older, uh, perhaps. And so uh, this area was thought to be, uh, according to the previous paper I just mentioned, uh, a low-lying area with uh, dense forest, uh, tropical area, and then at eight million years, it came up and that changed. That changed it into an arid, uh, arid area with, with extensive savanna grasslands developing. So again, did that come up at eight million years? So that's the sort of the regional climate tectonic issue related to hominid evolution. On a more local scale, uh, as discussed in this paper published in 2007, it looked at the morphotectonic changes of particular areas in the central Kenya roof along the roof flanks. And they argued that the roof flanks could create barriers to, to precipitation and control the climate locally. So here's a picture of from northern Kenya looking into Ethiopia. So this is the Turkana, uh, Lake Turkana here right in the northern part of Kenya. Uh, so the Kenya-Ethiopia border is right like that. We're looking uh, uh, through from the northern part of the Kenya Rift and the southern part of the rift in Ethiopia up into the main Ethiopian rift over here. And in this paper, there are for features such as shown here, where this side of the, up, the, the rift is uplifted, creating a, a mountain range along the side of the rift. You can see the rift valley depressed in the middle here. And there's another rift flank over here. It's not quite as pronounced, uh, 
but but it, you can you can pick that out also as well. So what 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 uh, these authors and other others have argued is that the the uplift the, front, the roof flank uplift locally from place to place created uh, favorable environments for hominid evolution. And this idea was taken to another level in this paper where they coupled the uplift of the rift flanks with the development of lake, lakes in, in the basins in between, and they call these amplifier lakes. Uh, and that idea of an amplifier lake is illustrated here, uh, where at time one, if you take the development of the rift, if the rift flanks uplift at the right time with respect to down here, it's probably hard to see in the back, but this is a graph that shows uh, the orbital precession and time and years. So at, during the right time, you have orbital forcing where you have a, 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 a minimum here in, in the precession, but a maximum here in the lake level, maximum precipitation, so you have lakes developing. And in this case, during this period, because of the roof flanks forming here, you, you get a large lake in between, and so if you have two populations, they become isolated, and their, their evolutionary paths may diverge. If you, if you then dry out the lakes in sort of an in-between period, uh, if looking at the lake level and, and the forcing, then the lake goes away, but you may have uh, a chance opportunities for those populations to mix. And then if you get to a really dry period again, you have, have a barrier here that keeps these two populations isolated. Uh, so they argued in this paper that it wasn't just the, the root flanks coming up here, creating local microclimates and so forth, but it also, these root flanks we're also helping to control the, the comings and goings of these large rift lakes that then uh, help to create times when the populations could mix and when they would also be separated. So here's a picture of one of, one of those such lakes. This is Lake Manyara in northern Tanzania. And you can look into the south here, and you can see the rift scarp escarpment here uh, on, on this side. Now, now, with this, they argued, with this paper, they argued that this process was really critical starting about three million years ago. So there's another time point here to mention that the rift, in order for this to work, uh, they argued that the rift had to be mature enough with these rift flanks forming, being formed on both sides of the rifts by three million years in order to create uh, this amplifier, to, to be in the right, at the right time for the, this amplifier lake effect to, to, to be significant. Okay, so that's the climate side uh, of tectonics and climate. I want to say a little bit about the physical side. Uh, there's been a number of papers also that have argued that the physical environment created by the rifting also uh, promoted environments for, for hominid evolution. Uh, and uh, I'll show a number of pictures here from, from this paper or, uh, from Bailey et al. So one is that the rugged topography of the rift, so this is a picture from the rift in, in northern uh, Ethiopia, where you can see a lot of the rift fault scarps a lot of the, the basalt flows on the surface here. And a lot of these, these, these uh, fault scarps are very jagged, very high cliff faces. The, the, the basalts themselves can be very, uh, very hard to walk over, uh, very rugged surface. And, they, and Bailey and others have argued that this sort of environment actually provided security for hominids. Uh, they were much more able to traverse this kind of a terrain than predators chasing them. And so that this kind of environment was actually uh, uh, helped promote their their development. Related to that was also this environment uh, provided access to, to, to food from animals. And here's a, a false color image of part of the rift system in Kenya. You can see the large rift fault scarp here. There's a rift lake here. And you can see the highly dissected rift floor. Uh, and this kind of these kinds of uh, structures provide complex interlocking uh, patterns of barriers and blind canyons and so forth that could have been advantageous for trapping animals uh, and, or, or diverting animals and, and capturing them for, for a food, food source. So there may be some physical connection between the, the, the rift morphology itself and, and, and the supply of food for, for hominid, early hominid. Uh, channel water, so here's a, another picture from Ethiopia. There's a large rift scarp here and, and, and a down drop lock. And so this kind of environment uh, helps to, to channelize Fluid create areas where water, there's water supplies, also more fertile areas uh, to concentrate plant and animal life. So this is another another way that the rift environment may have helped to promote to promote an environment for for the evolution of hominids. Okay, so so again, just coming back to these two suggestions, one is that regionally there was 
prior modification by the plateau in eastern Africa coming up at 8 million years. And the second suggestion, again, is that there's both local climate effects and also a change in physical environment that could have promoted the evolution of, 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 of early humans. So are these two suggestions consistent with the, the tectonic development of, 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 of East Africa? Uh, and if you take a classic view of how the rift system formed, then the answer is yes. In fact, those suggestions came about because of a classic view of the, of the evolution of the rift system. So I want to just quickly go through this, this, this classic view, and then I'll talk about uh, what I actually think is happening. So in the classic view of rifting and plateau formation, again, we're talking about all this area here. Uh, the East African Plateau came up about 8 million years at about the right time. There was north to south development of rifting and uplift, so it started earlier up here in Ethiopia and propagated to the south, so it got into this area of Kenya and northern Tanzania uh, uh, maybe 5 to 8 million years ago. Uh, the rift development in, uh, in this critical time period, 4 to 2 million years, the rifts actually developed into full graben systems with rift flanks on either side, so that amplifier lake effect could, could come into, into play. So we have full grabbins forming, and we have highly dissected and, and, and faulted uh, rift, rift, rift floors. So that's sort of the classic view. And uh, the timing of this uh, works OK. This is a, a plot that shows age here in millions of years and latitude. And what's shown on here are, are, are different estimates of when rifting first initiated in different parts of the rift system, going from uh, northern latitude. So this is the eastern branch in black here. So we go from up here in Ethiopia, right here, starting at around 40 million years, 35 to 40 million years, excuse me, around 30 million. We get into central Kenya, this area here, around 15 million years. And then we get into this area here, in southern Kenya and northern Tanzania at, at, at around that 8 million year period of time. So the timing seems to work out okay with this uh, north to south progression of the rifting developing in this direction. The western rift, all of the right western rift that dates we have tend to open, to, tend to be right around this, this 8 to 10 million year period. So most of the rifts over here we think opened up, started forming again at this, at this critical time uh, of, uh, in, the, in the late Miocene. The rift, this idea of when the rifts, how the rifts form and whether you get the, the two rift flank uplifts uh, happening at the right time is part of this classic view of rift development. So if we have early stage rifting, uh, diagrammatically it's shown here where this is the crust and the mantle, and early in the rift process we get half grabbins forming, so we get an escarpment forming on this side and down drop blocks, but we, we don't get much relief on the other side. This progresses over time. Uh, through these sequences, and then you eventually get to a point where you get rift flanks well developed on either side of the rift, and a down drop block in the middle, where you can have rift flakes forming and large rift flakes forming, and this amplifier rift flake by taking taking effect. And then finally, you get to an area where this this rift floor can become very highly dissected, and you get uh, magnetism uh, in, uh, in in the area, lots of flood basalts coming out and making a very, very rough topography. And then eventually this. And this, I, this, this schematic, or this progression of rifting, you get to full seafloor spreading, where you start to, to rift the, the continent entirely and, and, and start a new, new seafloor. And this is what's happened in, in the Red Sea part of the rift system. Uh, so in the classic review, uh, again, at this 2 to 4 million year period, or 3 million years, we need to have a rift of this kind of morphology with flanks uplifted on both sides in order to create the right kind of, of topography, to create the right physical environment and the right uh, environment for those amplifier lakes to, to take into effect. Now, driving all of this in this classic, this classic view of, of, of the development of the rift system are plumes in the mantle. Uh, so this picture, what's illustrated here, deep at time one, deep in the earth, is a thermal disturbance. That thermal disturbance is buoyant. It's buoyant. It rises directly to the earth's mantle. That's shown here in time two. Uh, these, these, these thermal structures uh, and this, I, this idea can become quite large. And eventually, this thermal disturbance, its, it's point, rises and it impinges on the plate. The bottom part of the plate is shown here and mushrooms out, and it causes the plate to uplift and then to rip, to split apart. So that's what's illustrated here. So on top here is a map view showing how this, the time progression for Ethiopia. Here's Africa, Somalia, and Arabia. Uh, and then the plume impinges. It's coming up here in this location. Africa moves a little bit. 
over time. And then when it finally hits the base of the, of the plate, it's in this position here right underneath Ethiopia. Rifting forms, we get flood basalts forming, and then eventually uh, the whole system expands. So in this view, this plume is coming up underneath Ethiopia, the Ethiopian plateau. It's forming the early part of the rifting, and that that this this hot body and the mantle is then spreading out over time, extending to the south as well as to the north, creating the north the, this this so the, this this north the south uh, change in the in the rifting or development of the rifting. Now other people have taken this idea and argued, well, you actually need to have two different plumes. You can't just do it with one. So here's Another DEM topography is showing the Ethiopian plateau and the East African plateau here. And they've argued, well, at 30 million years, you need to have one rift here, or one, one plume here to form the Ethiopian plateau. Then you need to have one starting to pinch at the, on the base of the plate in Eastern Africa in this 10 to 15 million year time period to create the uplift here eventually at 8 million years across, the, across Eastern Africa. So that's the classic view of rifting that goes hand in hand with this idea that their tectonics has played. Uh, an important role in, in early uh, the early evolution of the hominids. Uh, so, really, is there a connection? Are these two suggestions actually correct? And uh, the work we've been doing suggests that the story is probably more complicated. Uh, so, what I want to tell you now for the rest of the talk is an about an alternative emerging view of how the plateaus formed and how the, the rift valleys formed and when they formed. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you or show you is that. Uh, the uplift of the plateau across eastern Africa, we think, uh, was coeval with the rifting. The, the, the plateau uplifts and the rift formed at the same time, but all of it formed much earlier uh, than 8 million years old. So it was there a long time before hominids came along. We're also going, going to show you that we don't think there was a single plume that came up beneath Ethiopia or East Africa, as shown in this cartoon here. But there was one massive large structure that actually originates in East Southern Africa and has worked its way through the mantle and comes up in Eastern Africa. Call this the African Superplume. And uh, I'll tell you a lot more about it tomorrow if you're, if you're interested in the structure. Uh, and that this plume is involved in large scale flow of, of hot material in the mantle that actually goes from the south to the north. So we're going from the south here to the north, not from the north to the south. So to understand all this, uh, why I do this, uh, I want to say a little bit about tomographic imaging. I'm a seismologist. I'm interested in, in reporting earthquakes and learning about earth structure from earthquakes and, and how seismic energy propagates through the earth. So one of the techniques we use is tomography. It's it, identical to uh, medical imaging, uh, except we don't use x-rays. We use seismic rays. So if you go to the hospital and you get a CT scan, uh, they use uh, x-ray source, and you have x-rays that go through your body and a bunch of detectors, and they back out the structure of your body by where the, where the x-rays go and what they do. Well, we do the same thing in earth imaging, but we don't use x-rays, we use seismic rays. And we don't have a controlled source. Uh, we have an uncontrolled source, that is earthquakes. They happen all over the place, but we can't set them off, they just happen. Uh, but we can control receiver locations, and so we can set up networks of seismic stations to record earthquakes and then use that information to understand earth structure. And the resolution of these images, whether you're getting a CT scan or you're trying to image earth structure, all depends on the rays and where the rays are and the ray density. So for example, if you have two blobs on the earth here and you only have two rays, the likelihood of imaging these two structures is pretty limited because the rays may or may not pass through, through those blobs. Uh, but now if we put a lot of seismic stations at the surface, and we record a lot of seismic waves at these stations, then we have a lot of rays that are crossing through these structures, and we have a better chance of resolving and backing out those structures. So what we do in seismic tomography is, is identical to medical imaging, but we use seismic waves or rays instead of x-rays. What does a seismic station look like? Here's a picture of a temporary station we deployed uh, some years ago in, in Uganda. This is our seismometer canister there, we put it on a concrete pad in the ground in the pit about a meter deep. Then we cover the, the seismometer with a drum, a plastic drum here, uh, and then we bury the whole thing so, so that it doesn't get tampered with and we also can, can, uh, doesn't, doesn't, uh, isn't that sensitive to vibrations at the ground, and we have a solar panel nearby for, for power. So we can install these pretty quickly and put them all over 
And here's some images uh, from Eastern Africa from uh, some of the studies we've done, this one in Ethiopia, one in Kenya, Tanzania, showing what our seismic tomographic or seismic CT scans look like. Uh, so this is an east-west profile going across the western plateau, the main Ethiopian rift here into the eastern part. MER is the main Ethiopian rift, that's this area here. And you can see the colors here show the reds are where the seismic waves are going slower than we would expect, and the yellows and blues are where they're going faster. So we can see that underneath the rift, and also on this side of the, of the Ethiopian plateau, the Earth's structure uh, is promoting waves that are traveling much slower than we would expect, and that's primarily a thermal effect. The rocks there are hotter than, than we would anticipate. Uh, in Kenya, this is the east-west profile across Kenya, right here. Here's the Rift Valley in Kenya, that area there. And again, under the structure, we see an area where the wave speeds are going much slower than we would ex expect, anticipate. And then this profile, east-west across Tanzania here, this is the eastern rift that comes from Kenya into northern Tanzania right there. And again, here we see this area where the seismic waves are much slower than we would anticipate, and then faster over here in this area of the Archean Kraton. Okay, so that's how, what some seismic images look like. Uh, and those are all pretty shallow. They all go down a couple hundred kilometers into the Earth. Uh, so if we want to understand the superplume, the African superplume, we actually need to image much deeper. So the African superplume uh, is this idea that underneath southern Africa, so here's Africa, this is a cutaway across southern Africa, there's a huge disturbance in this cartoon, uh, starting really, really deep in the earth, probably at the core mantle boundary, uh, a rock that is very anomalous, it's both very hot and also chemically distinct, and it's rising through the mantle, and it's causing Africa to be uplifted. Uh, so schematically, what this looks like is this, if we look at a, a cross-section going from southern Africa to eastern Africa here, like this, this is the lower part of the mantle. The structure is residing in maybe South Africa or southern Africa in the lower mantle. It comes up through the middle part of the mantle here, and then beneath East Africa it comes up to the top of the surface. Uh, so a few more things about the superplume. The very earliest images we had of the mantle uh, Earth's mantle from, from seismic tomography uh, were published in the late uh, early 1990s. This is a, 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 one of those figures from, from, from the Harvard Seismology Group. And this structure was, is so large that it was, it was immediately uh, uh, recognized in these early uh, images. So what's shown here, this is a kind of a hard diagram to understand, but this is the core, the Earth's core here, and superimposed on the core is a map of the globe. And this cutaway from the core mantle boundary here all the way to the surface is taken along this projection of this white line. So if we want to know what's underneath Africa in this image, we go over here. This is southern Africa. This is the core mantle boundary under Af southern Africa, and we can go right up to the surface under Africa. Here's East Africa, like that. So we uh, get the colors represent, the hot colors are areas where the waves go much slower than we would expect. Uh, blues and, and greens are faster. So this is the big structure, anomalous structure, sitting underneath southern Africa in the lower part of of Earth's mantle that was first recognized uh, way back in, in, in uh, a couple decades ago. Well, our images of the mantle structure from seismology have improved dramatically since then. We have a lot more data. We have a lot better ways of imaging uh, the mantle. So I'll just show you uh, two, two more modern images. This one was published in 2011, this one in 2012. And on these images, uh, the bottom part of these images is the core mantle boundary and the top is the surface, and these projections go along this trajectory, going from the southern part of the Atlantic through uh, southern Africa, East Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and so if we look under southern Africa, that's this structure here, and this is a large superplume structure where those seismic waves are going much, much slower. And in these, this image, it looks like it probably sinks through the middle part of the mantle and comes up beneath East Africa. That, that right there is right, is right there, comes up beneath. Uh, Ethiopia. Here's another one. You can see the large structure in the lower mantle where the waves are going much slower. And again, there's the suggestion that it snakes up through the middle part of the mantle and comes up beneath East Africa. So this area again, all, all the way across here. Now with these images, there, because we're doing this on a global scale, there are lots of issues about what we can actually resolve in these structures and what we can't resolve. And one of the problems uh, seismologically is this area right here in the mid-mantle. 
This is an area where it's very difficult to image the structure given the way the rays are passing through the model or through the earth. So whether or not the structure actually connects from the lower mantle to the upper mantle here has been hotly debated. Again, in this image, whether the, the structure actually continues across this area, it's hotly debated. So is this, in other words, is the structure through going through the mantle or is it actually two separate structures? Two, very different things happening in the lower mantle and the upper mantle beneath the Earth. Here's a, a 3D rendering of that structure. Uh, this is, again, a bit hard to, to see this diagram. There is Africa in that view right there. And the, the big red blob here is uh, that area where the seismic wave speeds are going much slower than expected underneath Africa in the mantle. And interesting, I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but there is a structure underneath the Pacific that's almost uh, right on the other side of the planet. So these are the two biggest structures in, in, the, in, the, in, our, in our planet. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the African superplume, and this is the South Pacific superplume. So, so again, the question is, is this structure, it's well developed in the lower mantle, does it actually extend into the upper mantle and come all the way to the surface and have something to do with rifting and, and, and plateau formation in, in, in Eastern Africa? So to address that, we need to really look at this area here and tell whether the structure is through going across the mid mantle. So to do this, over the last 10 years, we've been running various networks of seismic stations in Africa as part of a, an organization called Africa Ray. You can Google it and, and learn about it. I'm not gonna say too much about it, but we've had both permanent stations running and also temporary deployments of seism seismometers. So right now, as part of Africa Ray, we have a network that's shown here that has a whole bunch of seismic stations uh, across eastern and southern Africa, and some also in West Africa. We also have GPS uh, receivers on a lot of these stations, and we also have automated weather stations at a lot of these stations. So it's becoming a, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, observatory system uh, for, for much of the African continent. So we've been collecting seismic data, improving our seismic data sets over the last decade, using earthquakes recorded at these stations. Now these are big earthquakes. We record local earthquakes, but we also record big earthquakes that happen elsewhere, everywhere on the planet at these stations. Uh, and here's a picture of what the bricks and mortar look like. This picture is in Zambia, that station right there. Uh, and there is a, a, a structure here. Inside the structure is a concrete vault and on the concrete, a concrete pier rather. On that concrete pier we have our, our seismic equipment. And then at the surface of the, of the building here we have our solar panels and you can see our, how high tech our solar panel pumps are. <coughs> And then we have a GPS antenna there and an automated uh, weather sensor there. This is a station in Ghana over here. And in the basement of this building is another concrete pier that goes down to bedrock. This is our seismometer. This is actually a station that's been there for a long time. And you can see various vintages of seismic equipment that go all the way back to the early 1960s. It's been spread mainly through Eastern uh, Africa. So all these dots on here belong to different temporary networks that we have been part of over uh, the past few decades, going through Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, all the way through Zambia, all this providing data to help us image the structure of the mantle underneath, underneath <coughs> Southern so Africa. So what do we find? Well, I'll uh, show you two tomographic images uh, using our data. Uh, they're much higher resolution than the previous images I showed. Uh, this is the first one, paper we published in, in 2012. And this slice goes from near the core mantle boundary. We're not quite at the core mantle boundary, but near the core mantle boundary, this surface again here along this profile, a, a prime, so going from southern Africa across eastern Africa into the Arabian Peninsula here. And so what we see quite clearly is this low wave speed structure where the waves are going much slower of the African superplume in the lower mantle. And it looks pretty convincing that it continued right through the mid mantle and connects with the anomalous structure here beneath Eastern Africa and, and Ethiopia and also in, into, into Arabia. So to us, this is pretty convincing evidence that this structure is connected all the way down, all the way from the core mantle boundary here, going all the way up to the surface. So the tectonics we're seeing, the rifting and the uplift in Eastern Africa, really has its origin in something that's happening way down here at the core mantle boundary beneath Southern Africa. Uh, this is another picture, a slice zooming in now. Uh, this is a different model, with slightly different data sets constructed in a slightly different way, but it shows the same, the same thing. This profile goes from southern Zambia through Tanzania and into Kenya along this profile here. So here's Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya over here. And what we see is this area again with low wave speeds. 
Uh, it's beneath the western branch of the root system here. That's this area here. It's beneath the eastern branch over here. That's this area here. The craton, the Archean craton I told you about before, is this area right here. It's sitting in here, this area where the seismic waves sweep are much faster. The lithosphere is, we think, is intact, and again, it's much thicker. The plate is much thicker here, beneath this area, than over here. And you can see this structure go extend from the surface all the way down to depths well <coughs> into, the, into the lower mantle. So again, we think pretty convincing evidence that this structure is connected all the way from the surface, all the way to the core mantle boundary. Now, one other piece of information we can get from our seismic uh, data is we can actually look at how seismic waves propagate in certain directions <coughs> and tells us which way the rock and the mantle is flowing over geologic time. Uh, so we do this, it's called seismic anisotropy. We, we look at shear waves. So these are shear waves that are propagating, they're generated by large earthquakes, they travel through the earth. And if they encounter uh, a rock that is anisotropic, then the shear wave will become polarized, and there'll be a part of the wave will travel faster, shown by the green wave here, and part of that wave will then travel slower. Uh, so this is the slow shear direction, this is the fast direction in this anisotropic medium. So the, the shear wave actually splits into two waves, and we can measure these two waves, we can measure the time delay between them, uh, we can also determine the, the, direct, the past direction. Now, we think in the mantle, the mantle is mainly made out of a uh, 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 mineral called olivine. And when olivine flows over geologic time, it gets elongated in a certain direction along the fast direction. So if we can determine the fast direction in our, our shear waves, then that tells us which way the mantle is flowing. And so we've done that. And we've done that across all of Eastern Africa, and that's illustrated here. So it's shown here in these blue lines are the fast directions of that shear wave, which is the direction that indicates which way the mantle is flowing. Uh, and you can see, so the, the, there's a scale here. This, the, the length of these blue lines represents the time delay between the fast wave and the slow wave. Uh, but you can see the orientation here through Kenya, Ethiopia, into the Arabian Peninsula. There's all this general north northeasterly direction of flow in the mantle. Now, if we look down here in Tanzania, it gets a little more complicated. Down here in Zambia, it looks like it's more or less in this northerly, northeasterly direction. Then we get to the area of this Archean Craton, and it looks like the flow is going around it. The, 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 the fast directions bifurcate and go around it like this, and then they coalesce again to the north here and continue to the north. So we think this is pretty convincing evidence that this structure, this big structure in the lower mantle, the superplume structure, is coming all the way through the mantle, it's coming up to near the surface, and it's flowing in a northerly direction, as illustrated in this diagram. So this is the picture I showed you before, the superplume structure coming through the mid-mantle and turning and going to the north. And so here it is on, on its side, put in sort of a three-dimensional uh, rendering. So the structure we think is coming up from deep in the mantle here, as shown by this arrow, comes through the mid-mantle, and then it turns and flows to the north in the upper mantle, as illustrated here. Now, because we have this Archean craton right here, the plate is thick, some of that flow actually gets diverted around the thick plate, and that's illustrated by these arrows here. So the, the divergence of, the, of, of, the, of these fast directions around the craton is because it has this thick lithosphere, or thick plate, and the flow that's coming up here, some of it has to go around it. Some of it goes under it, some of it goes around it, and that creates this pattern of the divergence of those directions. So we think this is pretty compelling evidence that the structure is a through-going structure. It originates at the core mantle boundary, comes up and flows all the way like that. So it's going from the south to the north. So this is a very different idea than of the, compared to the two separate plumes that I showed you before driving the rift system. It's, it's, it's a much bigger structure, and it's going in the opposite direction. Now, in 2012, a, an important paper was, was published that provided dates for the volcanics in the southern part of Tanzania, in the Rungo Volcanic Province. So again, here's a picture of the part of the rift. This is the western branch, the eastern branch. Lots of volcanism in the west, eastern branch over here that's been well dated. But very little volcanism in the western branch and in this paper, they actually discovered, in this volcanic province here, right there, just north of Lake Malawi, 
They discovered evidence for volcanism starting at 25 million years ago. They're much, much older than anyone had anticipated. The diagram I showed you before, it showed most of the Western Rift opening up around 8 to 10 million years. Now we know that there was volcanism and probably rifting in this part of the system that dates all the way back to 25 million years ago. So we put all this together, we put our seismic images together with this flow from the south to north. We put this, the, this together with this, the, these new dates of rifting starting at 25 million years down here in the southern part of the rift system. And it paints a completely different picture of how the rift system has developed and the whole timing of the rift system. So what we think is happening, as shown here, is you have evidence for rifting starting here in volcanism at 25 million years. That's about when it started here in central Kenya. Ethiopia is a little bit older, probably around 30 million years old. But within the uncertainty of these dates, it looks like there was activity, volcanic activity and rifting uh, that was probably happening about the same time across the entire rift system. So we argue if that was happening, that could be happening because we have this big this big structure, the top rock that's upwelling from deep in the mantle, that's coming up beneath this area here, and then turning and moving to the north, like that, uh, over time, creating the, the uplift of this entire area, and also <coughs> leading to the volcanism and, and the rifting. Uh, so that's the super plume connection to the rifting and tectonics in Africa. Okay, so to wind up things, let's come back to these two suggestions about the linking uh, tectonics with climate and, and then human evolution, hominid evolution. Uh, so the first one was the plateau uplift influenced the environment which supported hominid evolution. This was the regional picture of the East African plateau coming up at 8 million years. We don't think that happened. Uh, we think that the plateau probably started much earlier than that, at 25 to 30 million years. It was probably there long before hominids came along. Uh, so we don't think there is, that this structure here is any bearing, the timing of it has any bearing that's relevant to hominid evolution. Now, there could have been climate change happening across this area in 8 million years. So there could have been a aridification, there could have been changes from tropical, dense tropical forest to savanna grassland uh, that would uh, promote uh, hominid evolution and bipedalism in, in particular. Uh, but that climate change probably had nothing to do with the plateau, probably had to do with something else that was happening uh, that was changing circulation patterns and, and moisture in the atmosphere and so forth. It didn't really have anything to do with the tectonics of the region. Okay, so the second suggestion then is that we have these localized Rift Valley environments that created favorable environments, both climatologically and also physically for the hominids. And that certainly remains a possibility, uh, but with the amplifier lake hypothesis, they, they argued that, that the rifts were really developing at this two to four million uh, time period that was critical for hominid evolution. And we think that the rifts probably started forming much, much earlier than that. Uh, and so the rifts were probably pretty well formed, most of them, or, or parts of them anyway, pretty well formed well before hominids came along. So they could, the, the, the environment could have been there when hominids came along, but that environment didn't develop uh, coincident with, with, with the evolutionary changes that were ha happening at, 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 that, at that time from the late Miocene uh, moving forward. Uh, so, so this could have happened, but again, the timing uh, is, is, is questionable. Uh, and also, th this idea of north to south progression, uh, it's not necessarily that important for the story of hominid evolution, but uh, again, we think that the progression here probably goes from south to north that the structure came up beneath northern Zambia, southern Tanzania, from the lower mantle, uh, and it migrated to, to the north, uh, not the other way around. Okay, so I think that's it. I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully we have a few questions. Where, where on that map is the old Dogby Gorge? The uh, Olduvai Gorge? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can get a, a, a better map here. Um, on this one, so Olduvai Gorge is, is in northern Tanzania. It's, it's right about there. So it's right between the two? Yeah, so it's the, the eastern branch comes down through here. This area of northern Tanzania, the rift breaks into uh, lots of different small branches, and the Olduvai Gorge sits in one of those. 
uh, over here, uh, right along the border. Of the of the Great Dump. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was looking at all your pictures, your images here, and I saw whole mantle convection, whole mantle movement. Where's all that asthenosphere that's in all the geotopes? <laughs> Come and I talk to Mark. Okay. I'll tell you. <laughs> I will. That's a very good question. Uh, so, for those of you who aren't going to be in my talk tomorrow, uh, there's a, a there's a still a very big debate about actually what's happening in the mantle convection. Whether the mantle convects in two layers, what's happening in the upper mantle is separate from what happens in the lower mantle. Uh, and we've known now for a long time from seismic images, tomographic images, that in some places the slabs with the cirque slabs penetrate all the way to the coronal boundary. So that represents one large limb of a large downgoing conduction system. So if that's the case, then you have to ask the question, where's the return flow? If you have conduction, you've got to have a return flow. If stuff's, cold stuff's going down, then hot stuff's got to be coming back up somewhere. And that's where it's coming up. So these two big structures sitting beneath Africa and in the Pacific I think represent the first order return flow of that warm material. So the plates are going down, it's the cold stuff, it's dense, it's sinking. So this is just simple density driven flow in the convection system. Plates are sinking, and then the material at the core matter boundary is heating up and coming up into these, these, these big structures. So, when are you suggesting the amplifier lakes really started out? I mean, clearly it's before 3 million years, but are we talking 8 million years, or are we talking 15 million years? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so I think to get really substantial lakes, you need to have both rift flanks pretty well developed. You know, if you have early stage rifting and you only have one rift flank uplift, then you sort of have uh, uh, a gradual change in elevation on the other side. You, you, know, you don't have that much space, and you might not get a very deep lake. I don't know if you create that big of a barrier. Uh, so I think you really need to have the rift evolve to the point where you have, you have pretty big escarpments on both sides. Uh, so eight million years, it could be earlier in some places. I really don't. I don't know. You know, uh, we don't. I don't think we really know. You know, this paper in 2012 with these old dates from the Rimba volcanic complex here and, and rifting. Uh, you know, totally through monkey wrench and everything, uh, because it's much much older than than, than we anticipated. So eight million years so eight million. would be really important. Time. It, it could be, yeah, yeah. So, so again, you know, physically, you know, in terms of the, the rifts forming, the, the rift morphology forming, and the amplifier lake effect coming into play, that certainly could have happened at three million years in some places. It could have happened maybe eight million years in other places. Uh, uh, but it could have been, they could have been there a long time before the hominids came along. Is, is the point? It, 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 in that paper I showed you, they argued that it was coincident at the same time. That the rift morphology was developing at this critical period of time in hominid evolution, and so it promoted certain evolutionary changes. I don't necessarily think that timing works necessarily. Uh, it's, it's hard to, you know, in, in several places there could have been really well formed rifts long before them. So then it's really the climatic cycles that are making a difference in right. the late growth and the right. shrink to yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.